Well, good morning. Happy Monday. The Nats won. This is the big news of the day. And at 4.30, they're going to start winning again. Um, I think we should begin with what is probably going to be among the defining issues of this council's year, and that is the Clarksburg debate. It is a debate that has raged since 1994, fundamentally, and a series of 5-4 votes as to how we should proceed with development in Clarksburg, a community that clearly does need <coughs> more development, a community that has not been particularly well served, quite frankly, in, in a number of respects, a community that is concerned about its future, and we need to address those concerns. But we also have a responsibility, an environmental responsibility, with respect to Ten Mile Creek. And in 1994, when we began this conversation, we made it clear that when we get to, quote, stage four, which is where we are now, that is opening up the last parcels, potentially, of development, there was this big flashing yellow light, some would say even a red light, that said, we're going to pause and look at what we've done and whether or not we have done it in a way that adequately protects Ten Mile Creek. And if we are to proceed, we need to look at how we should proceed in a manner that protects Ten Mile Creek. And so that is really where we are again. The county executive uh, had sent over a memorandum in which he had said, in effect, Really, folks, we haven't turned to the master plan process, and if we're not going to do it by a master plan, we need to look at alternatives as to how we can make these decisions. Um, and the reality is we do need to step up and make these decisions. These are critical decisions for our community in every manner, and critical for our government to be responsible and to act. But how we act in my judgment, is as important as acting. So I feel like we punted this decision for far too long. I was not a big fan of uh, the work study group that took place in 2009 because I felt that it was just a way of punting this issue. And sure enough, that study group didn't come to a consensus either. Uh, it was five people that said we need to do a master plan amendment and three people that said we can do it in water and sewer category changes and a couple of people saying uh, I don't know what we're going to do. So now here we are at a place where we really do need to make a fundamental decision. The development community and the business community in Clarksburg is very concerned that if we do a master plan process that somehow that will be prejudicial to them and that uh, it could result in less development going forward, and that's not what they're in favor of. Uh, and they would prefer that we do this somehow without the planning board's involvement, and whether or not we can just, quote, look at these issues uh, on a scientific basis and decide what to do. Um, I spoke with the county executive this weekend, and the county executive made clear to me that he favors a comprehensive approach to this issue. And ladies and gentlemen, there is only one comprehensive approach to these issues, and that is through the planning board. Um, so he clearly is in favor of a planning board process. Our planning board chair and colleagues are in favor of the planning board process. Uh, our staff is strongly in favor of the planning board process. It needs to be an expedited process. Um, but it is something that the county executive, our planning board chair, our Department of Environmental Protection, our DPS, our staff, all have said is the right way to go. I say all that to you. I don't know what my colleagues will decide. There is a strong uh, split with respect to this. Could be another one of those 5-4 votes. So now I will speak as an individual council member and as chair of the committee and was in charge of, if you will, environment or lead responsibility for the environment, um, I feel strongly that it must be through the planning board process. Um, that to decide in advance that we're not going to change our land use in any way, shape, or form in that area seems to me to be inappropriate. 
You can't make that decision in advance. You do need to look at the science. But the science could lead you to a conclusion that says what we have, what we have allowed in terms of density or in our zones, we need to rethink 20 years later based on the experience that we have with 10 Mile Creek and what development does. On the other hand, we have new standards for protecting creeks that have come into place both at the state level and that those standards need to be taken into account. I want this to be a science-driven decision and I want on the table the opportunity to assess whether or not we need to make any tweaks or modifications to our land use decisions because this is fundamentally about land use. It is about protecting Ten Mile Creek, but we're talking about moving a lot of earth around. Anytime you move a lot of earth around, you're going to have an effect on very fragile streams. Ten Mile Creek is among our most fragile streams. I have shared with uh, others that uh, I'm a fly fisherman. Um, trout only live in the most pristine streams. They are such a wonderful marker of how a stream is in terms of its health. If there's a brown trout in a stream, you know it is a pure place to be. There are brown trout in that 10 mile creek. And from my perspective, that's something worth protecting, not because of the fish, but because of what it bespeaks in terms of the purity of that environment. Now, we can make a different decision and say that we don't really care whether or not Ten Mile Creek is pure or not. And that's, that's something that people can make a, a decision with respect to. <coughs> so, uh, our staff has done a memorandum that will be made available to you that lays out, and I believe, a very compelling way why it is that deciding this through the prism of land use is the most appropriate way to go. And I will be supporting our staff and our planning board chair and our county executive in that pursuit. What else do we have to talk about? Let's talk about Pepco since Charles Washington is here. He must have anticipated that I'd talk about Pepco. Um, over the last several days, over the last week really, it has came to my attention and to Pepco's attention that there was a serious billing issue. A billing issue that arose at the time of swapping out meters. It didn't have anything to do with the smart meters per se, but it had something to do with swapping out meters. And when they swapped out meters, um, they were using estimates for the next month's billing cycle. Uh, and it turned out that those estimates bore no relationship to reality. And residents were complaining that they were literally paying $300 more for an estimated bill than they'd ever paid in their lifetime. And I opined that um, while PEPCO does have the authority under its tariff to use estimates, um, in my judgment, it is an abuse of that tariff to use estimates that bear no relationship to reality. Um, PEPCO does have every month's billing on file. They, they do bill customers and they have it on file. So it doesn't seem to me to be too hard to figure out what a reasonable estimate would be. It'd be an estimate that would be at the average of their billing as opposed to something that is way outside the norm. Um, I was pleased to see that PEPCO recognized that it did have an issue on its hands and that had taken immediate steps in its judgment to try and rectify the situation. So my hope is that this matter can be rectified expeditiously, that no one at a time when everyone is pinching pennies, it is absolutely not okay to use an estimate that effectively was two and a half times greater than what they had ever used in terms of energy in 23 years. So I am, uh, I've been advised by PEPCO's vice president that they're all over this, that they're gonna take care of it, uh, and I certainly hope they will do so. We had a, um, 
a number of transportation related issues to uh, that came up over the course of the past week one of which was we had the uh, Maryland Department of Transportation come to our county and have its annual quote road show in which it shared with our county what its budget would provide for the next year uh, and a number of us attended that meeting on Thursday evening and we uh, shared with the acting secretary of transportation our concern that we have to have a funding mechanism at the state level that allows our state to fund the transit projects that are so critical to the future of our county's economy and our way of life in montgomery county and our state's economy so we made our pitch to the state that either they provide a funding mechanism at the state level or they allow our county to have a funding mechanism locally such that we can move forward with the transit projects that are so important to us which includes the purple line the cct and rapid transit um, so we also shared with the head of the state highway administration our hope that they would uh, take some positive action on the Fairfax Montgomery County proposal to use the shoulder uh, on the seven mile stretch on either side of the American Legion Bridge. Uh, they are aware of that proposal and they are studying it and they hope to get back to us by the end of the year with respect to that suggestion as part of its larger study of that entire area. And we shared with them our desire to make some progress on 270 uh, by adding an HOV lane uh, repurposing an HOV lane going southbound during the peak periods uh, between uh, 370 and Clarksburg which is something that had been contemplated uh, since the early 90s and not been acted upon so we're pushing hard on transit we're pushing uh, we're gonna have a briefing on Thursday from our uh, Department of General Services on the status of the transit center in Silver Spring which everybody knows, of course, has uh, been beset with uh, some uh, construction sets of issues. Uh, we are still analyzing those construction sets of issues, but uh, I remain confident that we will resolve those construction sets of issues, at least, uh, and be able to move forward with that transit center. Clearly, there's going to be delay, but uh, I, I'm hopeful that that delay will be no more than approximately a year. Uh, and that we'll just get about fixing it and then we can figure out who's responsible for the mess that we're in. Uh, I don't want and I don't believe our county is going to allow the uh, litigation sets of issues which may arise to get in the way of fixing the problem and so that it is there for our people. Um, we have also with respect to transportation, we are now working on a new mechanism or it used to be called the growth policy but now it is called uh, so what is it called now it's uh, called uh, what, what, what is it called subdivision, subdivision staging policy um, so we're making changes to our transportation tests uh, there have been proposed changes to our transportation test uh, instead of what is now called uh, PAMR we will now have TPAR, and uh, the fundamental difference between the two is that now we will be looking at our transit and uh, road situation separately and having two tests, both of which must be met, uh, as opposed to one test. Uh, and I think that probably is an improvement. And we will also, if, this, if we adopt this, uh, we will be fundamentally just looking at peak travel as opposed to average travel times and focusing our tests on peak travel. I think both of those are improvements and we also have a suggestion to improve our local area transportation test by looking at queuing in certain instances in which uh, traffic seems to be backing up and the current test is not deemed to be adequate to really address whether or not there's a problem there. So between uh, Clarksburg and transit sets of issues and our weekly PEPCO update. Um, I think that's all I have on my uh, 
affirmative agenda to raise, and I'm happy to respond to any uh, questions that you folks have. Sorry, mm -hmm. Tomorrow you are introducing a resolution to study uh, complications. Uh, one, to find out if there are plans to change compensations for county council, sheriff, county executive, and state's attorney. Uh, I am not aware of any plans. Okay. Do you expect that they would be? I know they've been held flat in recent years. Do you expect them to be continuing to be held, to be held flat? I have no thoughts on it whatsoever. I am doing it as a courtesy. I, this is not an agenda of our council. In terms of the Pepco and billing situation, have you, uh, how are you made aware of that situation? Do you have emails from uh, county residents? Would there be a way I could get copies of those? Absolutely. I believe those copies were distributed to the press, okay. not by my office, but by one of the grassroots organizations, which is how it, it, it came to be such a, a hot button issue. I think that this is one of those situations in which the grassroots organizations have done a, a very p positive service to our community. They publicized this issue, it got on the radio, it then got PEPCO's attention and PEPCO realized uh, we've got a problem here. Uh, but I'm happy to share with you the email we got with respect to it. We forwarded on to PEPCO and said, uh, really this isn't, doesn't look right to us. And the response we got in that initial email was, gee, you know, uh, understand, but uh, we do have the authority to do this. In, uh, in terms of the smart meter, this isn't the first issue that's been brought up in terms of that. What's your, uh, what's your take on the transition between the old analog meters to the smart meters with them having caused some fires, having this billing issue, having multiple things going on? Well, do you think that this has been a smooth transition? Well, Ron, I don't believe, again, that this issue has anything to do with smart meters per se. They could be swapping out one meter for another meter, okay? So I don't put this at the doorstep of smart meters, fundamentally. Okay. okay. Let me ask you about this uh, smart meter uh, issue. Uh, you said that you hope it's going to be rectified, and we told you they're all over it. Uh, but you seem to be keeping a little distance as to whether they will affect a fix in all this. What's your level of confidence that this is going to be taken care of and people need not worry about it? Well, either PEPCO fixes it or we have a state regulatory agency whose responsibility is to make sure that it is fixed. Mm -hmm. So as between PEPCO and our Maryland Public Service Commission, I fully expect it to be fixed. There's nothing that you can do with the council president? There is nothing I can do other than to say it really does need to be fixed, and we have two institutions who have principal responsibility for fixing it. Our county council has no authority in this matter other than to bring it to people's attention. Do you have any idea how many people were impacted? I don't, and I don't believe PEPCO does at this moment in time either. I think they think it's a relatively small universe of people. Uh, so. But I don't know the answer to that. How many people did you personally hear from? Well, I had only seen one story, one email mm -hmm. in which I saw that too. Yeah, that, that's the only one I had seen. And uh, I went, when I was asked about it, I, I certainly indicated I had not gotten a lot of emails with respect to this. Okay. But clearly, if it happened to one person, it's happening to more than one person, and it, it shouldn't happen. I mean, there's just no excuse for not using a reasonable estimate when you have their billing information. Mm -hmm. you know, there some things you say to yourself, gosh, you know, this is hard stuff. Quite frankly, this isn't hard stuff. They've got the data. If you're going to use an estimate, then use an estimate based on their actual usage. I wanted to ask you about the bag tax as well. You, you, you're revisiting that. Can you explain to us <laughs> what you're doing? Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, we had a committee meeting to review regulations that were necessary for the bag tax. Um, we're seven months into the program. I had just come from a Council of Governments meeting in which there was a discussion of bag taxes across the region and across the country, and there was a review of uh, what of a lot of other jurisdictions are doing. Um, as you may know, some jurisdictions have banned plastic bags completely and tax paper 10 cents. Okay. Uh, it's, there's a wide variety of approaches. An increasing number of communities are embracing this. 
Uh, what I made clear at the committee was that I, I remain very supportive of this. I am proud of our county for taking this initiative. I believe it's critical to changing people's consciousness, to shifting people to a more sustainable consciousness. We need to promote that, and I believe a bag tax is the most appropriate means of doing that. At the same time, I believe that we have a responsibility not to overreach and to make sure that our, we achieve what we want to achieve without making people resentful of how we go about our business. And I confess I'm one of those people that when we're talking about a five cents tax at a Macy's, when you're going into a department store to buy bedding, it isn't a context in which I normally think of people bringing their reusable bags. And so I ask myself, is this really bringing about the desired result or are we just aggravating people? So what I asked was that when we are done with our first full year of implementation, that we step back and ask ourselves collectively those kinds of questions and see whether or not this very good program needs to be tweaked. And that's what I expect good government does, which is when you have a new program, you review how it's doing, and you want to make sure that you're not doing more than you need to do and that you're doing what you want to do well. So it's really just good government, from my perspective, to ask those kinds of questions. And that's what I expect to happen at the end of the year. Are you also going to be reviewing what's done with that money once it's uh, collected? I know it's supposed to be going to, I think it's Environmental Protection, Department of Environmental Protection. But uh, is it going to be, I know it goes into that fund, is there going to be some way of tracking, okay, we collected this amount from the tax, and then we spent it on this within this fund? Is that going to be? That, that will be done as well. I don't have the same concerns that you do that seem to underlie your question, but with respect to this, because we spent so many more dollars on protecting the environment than this represents, uh, I, I personally don't have any doubt that these dollars are being spent wisely. But yes, it's a fair question, and we need to track the dollars too. So that will be done then this week? Yes. What's your reaction to the governor's report last week on the utilities? And given the solution you have with PEPCO, that would mean that we separate the CSA and the governor's plan would allow them to charge people more every time they want to do that. Does that show one? Does that show this is a bad idea? Well, let me answer it in the following way. Okay. I believe the governor's task force includes a number of very positive recommendations. Um, he, the recommendations of the governor would expand current reliability standards beyond what they are today. They would include uh, storm-related outages as well as blue sky outages. I think that's a very positive step. The governor's also proposed to increase the number of poor performing meters that must be fixed from approximately 3% to 4.5%, so almost one and a half times what we currently have. I think that's very positive. The governor's embraced something that was very important to me. His recommendation number 11, I believe, is that we move forward with a pilot program of the energy of the utility 2.0 model, which I am an advocate of and want Montgomery County to be a pilot of. So from my perspective, that is really so important because we need to get out of, if you will, putting Humpty Dumpty back together again. We really need a system that works for the 21st century, and in my judgment, the utility 2.0 perfect power model is something that we need to really embrace and I want us to work for. So I'm very much in favor of that. I also believe the governor's right to be promoting performance-based rate making. That is to make sure that PEPCO has all the incentives to perform rather than get paid on some other basis. The governor's proposal with respect to a tracker for investments that are made on an accelerated basis is something that I am finding somewhat problematic. Um, I think it's going to be very difficult to know what that level of investment is. And quite frankly, the expression that comes to mind is, I think the governor's in the right church, but in the wrong pew with respect to this issue. Because I think what you really want to focus on are results. You don't want to focus on, in on investments because you don't know whether those investments are going to bring about the results you want. So I would tie this to, again, performance 
rate making and say that if PEPCO improves faster than the standards, improves, not make investments, but improves faster than the standards, then that ought to be subject to performance-based rate ma making. But Montgomery County residents have been on the short end of the stick in terms of performance. And that's where, in my judgment, we need to keep the focus. How much of an issue is that, that this was many people say the General Assembly that we don't have to resort to Montgomery County problem because there will be other utilities that they don't have to resort to? Is it that they're not paying attention, they don't know it enough of what the problems are down here? It seems when you statewide things, you should have to go to the state and get fixed. People will just sort of shrug their shoulders and tip off my arch. Well, in some ways, I think that's right. I mean, when you have one of the worst performing utilities in the nation, then it is our problem, and it's not Baltimore's problem to the same degree. So I, I can understand why, particularly in Southern Maryland, which is served by a cooperative, they don't have the same problems. So they sort of shrug their shoulders and say, well, you know, good luck to you, uh, which is why we've always made the pitch to the Public Service Commission that they need to focus first and foremost on PEPCO, not linked to the rest of the state, but we've got a unique problem that needs unique solutions. And again, I think the utility 2.0 model might be something that uh, allows us to move forward in that way. We were talking about uh, transportation funding, um, and you said that you would ask the state to either provide that funding or, or allow Montgomery County to develop its own mechanism for collecting that funding. Funding. Can you be more specific on what mechanism you are talking about for Montgomery County? Well. I've been a strong proponent of an increase in the statewide gas tax, but if Western Maryland and the Eastern Shore or other communities don't share that desire and we can't get that to pass, then I see no reason why Montgomery County shouldn't be able to go forward and have a gas tax of comparable nature. Now, is that an ideal solution? No, because then you're in a competitive situation with other counties which may or may not have a gas tax. So if I was a gas station operator, I'd be saying to myself, this doesn't work real well for me. And I understand that. And we would ultimately have to figure out whether it's a good thing. But enabling legislation that allowed our county to make that kind of analysis, in my judgment, is absolutely called for. Um, one of the benefits of having such an approach is that we would retain all the dollars from such a tax, um, which would not be the case if we had a statewide gas tax. So I think in the end of the day, we'd have more revenue and we have more needs. And our needs should not be compromised because other parts of the state don't share our needs. Um, it's too important to our economic future. It's too important to the state's economic future. So the conversation historically has been about a statewide approach and everybody said, gee, come on, we can do this. I'm not convinced we can, and I don't believe that should be the end of the conversation. We need to know option B. We need to have a real option B. And is option B definitely a gas tax or are there other there mechanisms? Could, there could be other mechanisms, but the result has to be the same, which is local jurisdictions need to be able to move forward. If it's a gas tax, a sales tax, some other mechanism where counties can dedicate funding. I don't have the precise, I'm not fixated on a particular solution. I am fixated on a solution that is local based and provides the funding that our citizens need in order to move these projects forward. Would you, just to clarify, would you be a fan of a county I am a fan of having that option, okay? So what I have, let me be real clear, Rachel. What I believe the state legislature ought to do, if it's unwilling to pass a state funding mechanism, mm -hmm. it ought to enable local governments to adopt a local funding mechanism. Obviously people are, have fixated or fi fixed on a gas tax for some time. Uh, that's, in my judgment, a most logical approach, but it's not necessarily the best approach. So it needs to compete with other options that are out there. Do you have concerns North Virginia has a, an NPCA that would make all the they rely on the local authorities to, uh, to provide for transportation needs? Is there any concern that if Montgomery County did the same, some of the states that they would be 
I don't believe that there would be a constitutional challenge with respect to this. So I'm, it's the first time that that issue has been raised, and we've never been told that that would be an issue. What else, gang? With regard to Ten Mile Creek, um, you mentioned that you personally view this has to go through the planning board process. Are we looking at limited master plan amendment, full master plan amendment? Where do you see this fitting in that planning board process? Yes. I believe what is most urgent is that we look at all of, quote, stage four. You can call that limited, you can call that an amendment to the master plan. It is looking at stage four, which we said we would do. Um, at one point we had talked about internally including town center as part of that because we quite frankly thought we could provide more density in certain areas that would allow for a more vibrant walkable community. Um, we got a lot of pushback from those who went through the scars of the last master plan, uh, fearful that it would slow things down that were otherwise taking place or just create more uncertainty, and they didn't want to do that. Well, I don't need to do that. I thought it was going to be a plus for them uh, to create more economic opportunities, but if uh, a lot of the community doesn't want to do that, then we don't need to do that we do need to do stage four. So this would be limited to that, it would be expedited. My hope is, and my expectation is, that this could be done in 12 to 18 months. Mm -hmm. And let me circle back to that. The other process that has been s offered is a water and sewer category change. Water and sewer category change is gonna take at least a year all by itself. Because the science behind this is the same in whichever lens you use. It's either a water and sewer category or a master plan process. You're gonna to have to do the same science in either. And that's what's gonna take the most time here. So if you can make sure that you're looking at it comprehensively and do it in 12 to 18 months versus only look at one piece and do it in 12 months, that doesn't seem to me to be rational decision making. So that's why I feel strongly that on so many different levels, this is the most rational approach. Now, if one were going to take three years and the other was going to take the one year and you, bo and you both were comparable in terms of what they looked at, then you'd say, well, let's, let's use the former, not the latter. That's not the case here. Some developers have said, at least to me, that if you open up stage four, you are going to effectively freeze development in Clarksburg. What's your position on that? Is this freezing development in Clarksburg? How do you see that moving? Well, uh, we're talking about sophisticated people here, all right? People that have invested uh, many millions of dollars. There is no way a sophisticated player investing millions of dollars to not review the master plan that was approved, which had as big a flashing yellow light as any could possibly have had with respect to opening stage four and what would be necessary with respect to it and the controversy that existed at the time and has continued, and that was manifest in 2009 by the results of the working group. So this is not news to these people. It is going to be slow. It's going to be 12 months or longer on one path, or 12 months and a little longer on the other path. What the development community which makes no bones about it, wants to make sure is that we don't change the level of density that's there. And that could well be the result. We could get to the end of this process and say we don't need to do that. But to take that off the table a priori, for us to know in advance that we don't need to make any changes, I, I don't see how anybody could make that decision in advance if you want a, quote, science-based analysis because the science may lead you to conclude that oh no we can have things happen here but we need to have them happen differently than we had anticipated why would you not want that option another concern I know with the creek is that some dirt has already moved on either these properties or properties towards town center 
and then stop. And that that's what's kind of lending to the problem of the creek is the stall development itself, not stage four. Have you heard this argument? Is, is this something that you're also going to be considering? Absolutely. Again, I make no judgments as to what the final result should be. I am not predetermining that we ought to do anything differently than the developers want to do. I'm making no judgments. I am choosing a process that allows us to have all of our options on the table and that looks at it comprehensively. So this isn't about the result. This is about the lens through which you look at this issue and whether or not you're doing it comprehensively or property by property. And I would say that there is, for example, a great piece of property owned by Adventist, which has none of these issues, and which I've said to the development community, you're going to be wrapped around the axle of this environmental set of issues if you go on that property. You got none of those issues on the Adventist property. Are you talking to them? Why don't you move forward then? You can move forward with them tomorrow. Nothing's getting in their way. So if you want to develop on an extremely environmentally sensitive area, then you have to expect that there are going to be consequences. What else, gang? Then I think we're done. Thank, Thank you. you.